Welcome to this Wednesday webinar on the latest updates in the world of open access over the last 12 months or so. If you work directly with open access in any way, then most of what's to follow in this session won't come as any surprise, but I think it's good to see how it all sort of intersects and fits together. For others, it can be really hard to keep on top of all these changes in the open access landscape as policies and guidance change on almost weekly, daily basis. However, hopefully this webinar is going to help you understand the major changes that have happened since we ran it a year ago. With all of these changes, it's been actually quite hard to narrow down what to focus on, but I've picked five of the biggest topics um, that have come up in the last year. As we move through, you'll hopefully start to see how they all tie together and have an influence on each other. Open access is not really just a series of funders and publishers doing their own thing in isolation anymore. And it's more about different entities working together to change things. Working towards one goal rather than lots of different people working on the same thing at once is one of the major themes of Plan S. A quick recap for those who need it. Plan S is a set of 10 principles which were released by a group of European research funders in September 2018 as a way to advance open access publishing and the sharing of articles. Different research funders can choose to implement the, these principles in different ways, in a way that really suits them and the users they serve. But the aim is to make open publishing more coherent and unified, including things like having authors retain the copyright in their work, which ensures it's published um, by a compliant open access platform. And they're also working towards the standardization of publication fees. So there was quite a big reaction, not all of it positive, when the plan was first launched and Coalition S, who are the funders behind the plan, called for feedback to help move things forward. The feedback period itself was open from November 2018 to February 2019 and it gathered over 600 responses which have now been collated and released and I'm going to outline some of the main points, uh, the changes to the plan. So perhaps the biggest one is that originally the plan was set to be implemented from next year, so 2020, but this has now been pushed back and be launched instead on January the 1st, 2021. The rather tight timescale was a major concern when the plan was first announced, and this delay is going to give funders, publishers and institutions more time to prepare for and implement any necessary changes. It's still quite a tight deadline for a lot of people, but different funders are going to implement the plan in different ways. For some, January the 1st is going to be a definitive date where absolutely everything changes, and for others, uh, the plan and the principles will only apply to grants that are issued after this date, so to give themselves a bit of uh, room there. In line with this delay, the transformative agreements that are part of the plan will be supported until 2024, so again, that's another one-year delay. Plan S no longer supports hybrid models of open access publication, and that's where selected articles and otherwise subscription publication are made openly available in exchange for a fee. Under these transformative agreements, the publisher agrees to essentially transform these titles into fully open access publications within a certain time period, and they've got to be really, really clear about what that time period is and given an end date. A lot of Plan S feedback from publishers was that there simply just there wasn't enough time to do this and that the funders needed to take into account the range of different publishing models currently in use, which is something they seem to have taken on board with uh, the slight delay to Plan S. There will also be a greater influence on working to change the reward and incentive system in academia. So currently, researchers are rewarded arguably more on the basis of where they publish their findings than the quality of the finding them, findings themselves, which obviously is not right. Plan S aims to focus more on adapting the criteria by which researchers are judged as a way to help facilitate some of the more basic elements of change. So one of the key concerns was the lack of uh, or perceived lack of academic freedom when it came to choosing where to publish and the impact this would have on people's careers if they couldn't publish in certain titles. So Plan S uh, seems to have taken that on board and is going to focus on sort of changing that, the underlying um, problem of the reward system in academia. It's also going to revise some of the technical requirements 
of what makes a compliant open access repository. Again, taking into account feedback from people who know about these things and also what's possible within the, the time frame that was originally stated. Finally, Coalition S have released some new guidance on possible ways that the plan, the principles might be implemented. And if you go to the address on the screen there, you can access these guidelines. So Plan S was and will be a major change for research funders, not just in Europe, but actually across the globe. So it's no surprise that sort of in conjunction with this, a couple of open access policy reviews are going on. The two major ones I want to touch on in this session come from UKRI and the Wellcome Trust. So UKRI, which stands for UK Research and Innovation, is the body which works with UK research organisations and the UK government in order to facilitate research. They're currently reviewing both the RC UK policy, Research Councils UK, and the REF policy on open access. This is, is quite a big deal. As it's still ongoing until spring 2020 is the current deadline, there's, there's a limit to what I can tell you in this session. But I can tell you that it aims to align the policies of all the different research councils with the REF policy and consider how a, a group known as Innovate UK, which is the government's new innovation agency, is going to fit into all of this. How is this all going to work together? At the moment, it's anticipated that the REF changes as a result of this review are going to come into effect from January 2021. But the current policy for the REF in 2021 submissions is not going to be affected by this as it stands at the time of recording this webinar. So the Wellcome Trust have made slightly more progress with their review and therefore there's something concrete to report. The Trust funds a lot of research projects both in Cambridge and the wider world and they're a really major player in the research landscape. They were also one of the first to align their open access policies with Plan S and they've introduced changes which will come into effect from the 1st of January 2021. After this date, all research articles um, funded by the Wellcome Trust will be bound by the new policy, but monographs and book chapters are going to continue under the old policy, although it's expected that this is going to be monitored and reviewed. So you can see a summary of some of the key changes on the screen. Where they previously allowed a six-month embargo, Wellcome Trust now say that all research articles should now be available via PubMed Central and Europe PubMed Central at the time of publication. Authors need to retain the copyright in their articles and publish those under a CC BY license, an attribution license, unless an exception is granted to use a CC BY NC. So that's Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Licence, unless that exception has been pre-agreed. But I gather that's a reasonably rare circumstance. The idea of this is that it's going to ensure that other people, including those who want to do text and data mining on the outputs, are going to be able to reuse the materials that are funded by Wellcome Trust. In line with uh, one of the major uh, facets of Plan S, Publication in hybrid open access journals is no longer going to be supported by Wellcome Trust and that's something that has already taken effect. And then finally, where the output has a significant public health benefit, for example, a new medical treatment, then the trusts say that a preprint should be shared prior to peer review via an approved platform and under an open license. This will make sure that important and potentially life-saving research findings are accessible as soon as possible. So these two reviews are likely to be, I think, the first of many taking place as a result of developments around open access and Plan S in particular. They have the differences, but they've also got many similarities based on what we know so far. So it's worth keeping an eye, I think, on these kinds of developments. And you can always do that via the OSC blog or open access web pages or Twitter feed. So although the treatment of open access monographs is currently staying the same for Wellcome Trust funded projects, other funders have signalled that they want to include open access books and book chapters in any REF exercises that happen post the next REF in 2021. 
Those who work with researchers who commonly publish in books will know that this is a really complicated area. And it's one of the reasons that open access is quite rightly criticised for focusing too much on, on journal article publication, just simply because it's, it's easier to adapt to an open model than book publishing is. So JISC recently conducted a survey with the research community about the issues around open access monographs, which highlighted some key concerns. The main three were the sustainability, copyright, and the use of third party materials. So authors were concerned that funder mandates about open access are going to require them to publish their books openly, but they're not going to be given any funds to actually achieve this. Currently, the average figure for publishing an open access monograph is anything from about £5,000 to £11,000, which is a significant amount of money that most people, many researchers, don't have the access to. Researchers therefore argue that this is not a sustainable model of publication moving forward and that we need to consider some different ways of doing things. A lot of researchers are also worried about issues about peer review for open monographs and how we can maintain the integrity of scholarly works. And this is partly as a response to general concerns, I think, around closed models of peer review and partly um, the problem of the so-called predatory publishers who've already taken advantage a bit of the confusion around open access journal publishing. How is that going to work with monographs? How can we avoid the pitfalls that we've already had? Researchers are also quite worried, as they usually are, about potential copyright issues with open monographs, particularly when it comes to sharing work via an open license like Creative Commons. The disciplines that commonly produce books as an output are those like Arts and Humanities, and a great deal of their content comes from experience and interpretation of um, evidence and outcomes rather than the reporting of strict fact as you do in the sciences. Authors are therefore quite worried that by attaching an open license to their work, it's going to leave them open to misinterpretation and potential theft of their ideas and all sorts of problems. They also worry about how the use of third party materials, some of which are really, really integral to the arguments being made in books, can be used if an open license is then applied to the finished product. How is that going to work? So as with many issues in research report, there's not actually any kind of clear answer I can give you, and things are still developing all the time. There's currently no one single dominant model for open access monographs, and both publishers and funders are, in their words, exploring all options. One potential compromise, which might help the most pressing problem, is making the books free to read, but not openly licensed, which is the model favoured by some people in this area, but this is kind of out of step with Plan S. Currently, books don't need to be openly available in order to qualify for REF 2021, but this is expected to change in future iterations of the REF. Just a small plug for any Cambridge people who are interested in developments around open monographs. The OSC is aiming to hold an event in October which is going to bring together a range of panellists to talk about relevant issues in this area. So keep an eye on the usual websites, social media pages and add the date to your diary when it's advertised. A more concrete policy update for you, which is going to impact REF 2021, involves preprint services. So these are repositories which allow the upload of research outputs which have not yet been through peer review and have not yet been published. In some disciplines, these are routinely used as a way of um, sharing work with the community and researchers have been posting to them for a very long time and they get quite frustrated that they're then expected to repeat the process of sharing somewhere else because um, these services have not actually complied with open access and REF requirements. Even though they've already shared something, they have to go and do it again somewhere else. So the good news is this has recently changed. And as of July 2018, which was just after we did the last webinar on this topic, some preprints service are now compliant with REF 2021, meaning that researchers don't have to do that double upload. So these preprint services are compliant if they meet the following conditions. 
So the preprints need to be submitted to a qualifying preprint service such as Archive, but there is a list of ones that qualify for various reasons. The version that's submitted to the preprint service needs to be the same as the author's accepted manuscript version. And it needs to be uploaded to a preprint service before it's published online. So those are the three key conditions that um, a preprint has to meet in order to be REF 2021 compliant. So in many circumstances, this shouldn't be a problem. But researchers and librarians always need to check uh, carefully whether the service they're using is one that allows accepted manuscripts and is therefore compliant, because not all of them do. It could create problems further down the line if we don't get this right, so it's always better to check before you upload. For Cambridge uh, staff, there are some additional guidelines on local policy. If the chosen... Um, preprint service allows the upload of accepted manuscripts, then of course this should be done. And the upload needs to be clearly labelled as an accepted manuscript. This is so the open access team will go in and check it. If this isn't the case, then a copy of the accepted manuscript needs to be deposited via symplectic elements in the normal way within three months of acceptance. So it all hinges on whether um, the preprint service actually accepts accepted manuscripts. If it does, then researchers can do that, but they need to carefully label it. And if it doesn't, they still have to do the double upload, unfortunately. This can be confusing. So the OSE has got some guidance on their web pages at the address on the screen. And that guides you through um, which preprint services are compliant with sort of Cambridge guidance and Cambridge rules. One final update is something which has been rumbling on for a while. You've heard me talk about it in sessions and in other webinars, and that's contract negotiations between institutions and publishers. Over the last few years, there's been a growing number of disputes between universities and publishers about the cost of access to different materials. Many of these have involved the publisher Elsevier, because they're one of the largest and most high-profile publishers out there, which is uh, not really a surprise that a lot of the negotiations involve them. They're really popular with a lot of researchers. So universities in Germany and Sweden have already cancelled contracts with Elsevier, but another institution that's it's worth talking about briefly is the University of California. So they've recently, at time of recording, um, as of this week, this is all sort of kicked off, they've cancelled their Elsevier subscription after failed negotiations about the cost of open access fees and paywalls. This is a similar situation to other universities that have done this before, but I think what makes um, California different is the sheer size of the payment and the numbers involved. So reportedly, the University of California, which has 10 campuses and at least as many affiliated institutions, was paying upwards of $10 million a year to Elsevier, so losing that custom is a significant blow to them remains to be seen quite what will happen to their business model there. Reports from both sides of the argument claim that the other side wanted something unreasonable that just couldn't be done. The university claims that they were actually seeking a read and publish deal to offset the costs of open publishing. So um, that's where the kind of the costs are um, covered up front. And Elsevier claims that they did offer a combined price to cover both paywall content and open access fees, but the University of California just weren't willing to accept that, and neither side are willing to back down. So in practical terms, as of just earlier this week, this cancellation means that staff and students across the University of California don't have access to 2019 articles, the most recent ones, in any Elsevier journal. They can still access back files of some titles, as this is the sort of result of previous subscriptions. This move has the support of the majority of faculty and those who are after the most current articles are urged to use tools like Unpaywall and Google Scholar to access legitimately available open versions or contact the library for support through things like Interlibrary Loan. This is still quite new, it's still developing, so time will tell what kind of impact this cancellation has as it's one of the biggest to date. But if you look at institutions in Germany and Sweden, they've not reported any major issues. 
and the University of California is sort of monitoring developments in their terminology, so we'll see. One uh, potentially useful outcome for the rest of us, aside from watching all these um, negotiations with interest, is that the University of California has made available a negotiation toolkit which is based on their experiences. And this is a really useful resource if you've got responsibility for this area or any kind of negotiation, but also if you just want to learn a bit more about the process and that address is on the screen for you now. So that's a really, really whistle-stop tour of some of the key developments in open access over the last 12 months. Those of you who've attended previous versions of this session will probably notice that at least some of these areas are discussions which we've had before. They've been going on for quite some time, and they still don't seem to have an end in sight. Open access can be an incredibly fast-moving area, but it can also be one that gets fixated on the same debates as people try and find one solution that works for everyone. I'm not sure it's possible to do that in finding one solution that's going to suit all researchers in all disciplines and all funder and publisher models, but you never know what the open access update webinar in 2020 will bring. I just want to finish by saying that when dealing with researchers, you might find that they share some of these frustrations. And as librarians, I think we're quite likely to bear the brunt of them because we're kind of almost the public face of open access. Researchers are quite understandably confused when it comes to dealing with open access and it's important for everyone to help them understand that it, it often isn't the library who's making these decisions. Mandates will come down from research funders or from those who administer the REF. The local implementation is just a response rather than a direct decision from the university and just trying to make the researcher's life difficult. The more awareness that librarians can have about open access and its developments or its lack of developments, the more prepared we can be to deal with all the awkward questions. So that's all I wanted to say and I hope this webinar has been useful and as always, thanks for watching.